appreciate the opportunity to be able to come and to speak to you. Hopefully the things that I have prepared will help to all of us to understand a little bit better what it means to be a preacher of the gospel. You know, uh, a quote from 1 Kings 18 and verse 17 is something that always comes to mind when I think about a gospel preacher. And it was Ahab making a comment to Elijah. And he made this statement. Are thou he who troubleth Israel? And you know, um, a badge of honor, particularly for a true gospel preacher, he would say yes. <laughs> but in the context, you began to realize that Ahab was asking from the aspect that, you know, you're causing problems for me and I just don't like it. And the answer that Elijah gave is, I am not the one who troubles Israel, but you are. Because you're not leading the way God would have you to lead. And that gets us into the idea of what a gospel preacher is. You know, a casual look around our world today, and we see all kinds of preachers, not only in the Lord's church, but also in the outside world, in the secular world, denominationalism. You see women. You see young men. I've even seen five, six-year-old boys where they've got them on YouTube and other things like that up there just dancing around and screaming and hollering and slobbering all over themselves. And they call that preaching. The styles of preaching always will be varied depending upon the individual. Some uh, may be more monotone. Some may raise their voice. Some may slap the pulpit. Some might do a lot of other different things. We're not talking about styles today. We hire a lot of preachers today to evangelize. We want them to grow our numbers, keep Regular office hours. You see, that's what's in the mind of a lot of people that sit in the pew as to what I'm concerned about with hiring a preacher. They need to visit all of our sick. They need to visit those who are out of duty. We expect them to be on call 24-7. And sadly, particularly in the Lord's church, we want to keep them poor so that way they have to keep coming back to us to get what they need. We want an entertainer. We want an educated businessman. The list goes on and on and on of all the things that people may say that a gospel preacher ought to be and all that that means. But today we're not here to talk about style or their polish or even education. But I want to talk about three, th three things, but two things in particular we're going to... Uh, my wife looked at this sermon went over and I tried to get other people to kind of give me some feedback. She said, you know, your introduction is three pages long. And I said, yes, I know. I've got to figure out a way once I get up there how to cut all this out. So I'm going to hit some highlights as to answering two questions in particular. What is a preacher and what is his job? And then lastly, we're going to talk about the aspect that we're getting at, and that is what is he to preach? What is a preacher? Well, in the Old Testament, many of them were called prophets. And it all boils down to the idea, and particularly in the Old Testament, where God would directly reveal to a man as to what he was supposed to say to someone or write down, that kind of thing. And therefore, he was to present that and only what God told him to do. You look at Moses, who was a true prophet also, but he was able to write from the past as well as the present into the future. One of the few prophets that ever did that. Because we know that he wrote several books that were from the past that had to be revealed to him because he wasn't there in the beginning. But he wrote about it. They are inspired. They were inspired in that what God would give them in a message, they were instructed to write it down and speak exactly what God told them to write or to speak. They were troublers. 
They were people who spoke the truth. They told people what God wanted them to know, either positive or negative. And many times, as you know, particularly reading through the Old Testament prophets, a lot of it was negative, trying to make people change, to come back to God before it was too late. The word preacher just simply means a person who is a herolder or a, a person who speaks from divine truth, especially of the gospel, particularly in our age, and it comes from the word kerox. And in his work, in this work is learned that, first of all, he's a person who learns how to communicate. He's communicating something to us. He's one who teaches divine truth. He is one who speaks with authority from the scriptures. But that is delegated authority. He does not have the authority to change that message. Only what God has commanded him to say. And in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 6, we're told that he is to be a good minister. And in that means that he needs to be willing to remind the brethren of sinful actions and how to correct them. It was used to describe many men in the old as well as in the new, John the baptizer, Jesus, the apostles, Philip, Paul, Noah, and Stephen, just to list a few. But he's also called a minister. He was translated the idea of a deacon or a minister or a servant. And it's not limited just to preachers in this word but it is a word that is given over to talking about preachers also. It is often used to describe those who preach and teach, talking about Paul or Epaphras or Timothy. The preacher is also called an evangelist, euangelion or euangelos, gelios. Literally a bringer of good news. But there are words that do not describe the preacher. You won't find them in the Bible. But people use them all the time. They call them reverend. They call them fathers. They call them pastors. But what the work of the evangelist, Timothy tells us, is to preach the word of God. We're going to look at 2 Timothy 4 verses 1 and following here in a few moments. As we progress, I'm just going to allude to it for the moment. But we will get into 2 Timothy 4. He's to preach the word of God. He is to instruct the brethren of their responsibilities, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 6. In matters of prayer or modesty, the roles of men and women, 1 Timothy 2 verses 1 through 12. In matters of personal and family obligations, their du business duties, Titus 2 verse 1 through 10. And he's also to reprove them, those who are in sin, even elders, if need be. 1 Timothy 5, 19 through 21. He is to set in order things that are needed, encouraging the appointment of elders. 1 Timothy Titus 1, verse 5. He trains teachers, equip, equipping the saints for ministry. Titus uh, 2 Timothy 2, 2 and Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. He's to set an example to the brethren in word, in conduct, in love, faith, and purity. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12. He shows forth a pattern of good works in doctrine showing integrity and reverence. Titus 2 and verse 7. He is to be devoted to the word of God giving attention to reading and to exhortation and teaching, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 13. And he must learn to be careful how he handles the word of God, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. In contrast to the work of elders, you know, elders are to take heed to themselves and to the flock, Acts 20 and verse 28. Evangelists are to take heed to themselves and to the teaching, the doctrine, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 16. But what is he not? He does not do the work of elders. He's not a deacon or other member. He is not to be the official visitor of the congregation, the leader of prayer and public functions. He's 
he should feel honored to do so, but that's for every member of the church to do. He is to be expected to care for all the... Um, He's not to be expected to care for all the benevolence, all the personal evangelism, all the problems that arise within the Lord's church, and all physical chores. Every member must take part in those things. He is to teach and preach the word, not just run the church. He is not the leader. The elders are to be the spiritual leaders of a congregation and the overseers, not the preacher. He encourages and guides through teaching the word, but he is not the pastor. A solemn charge that Paul gave to Timothy. And he gave him this in review of the coming judgment, as well as pertaining to the preaching of God's word. And it is a charge that today needs to be considered carefully of all by those who preach the word of God in response to the Great Commission, Mark 16 and verse 15, and by those who send and support those who preach. Romans 10, verse 15 and following. Now that's basically, in a nutshell, the work of a preacher. But I want to stress particularly as we are going to in this lesson, does the preacher have the right to teach anything but the truth? Is it acceptable to God? Because I think that's a very important question. Because all you have to do is turn your television on uh, probably just about any day of the week, depending on if you've got cable or satellite or whatever you may have. And you can pick up some religious broadcasting from somewhere, and you'll begin to see the things that are being taught and upheld in the name of God on those channels. So let's look at the preaching that will please God. We can turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 4, begin there. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 2, it tells, it tells us that the preacher must be ready to be in season and out of season. Preaching that reveals a degree of preparation, in other words, study, that shows one has given to reading and to doctrine, and that one has been diligent in their learning. You know, the role of a preacher is one that he studies the Bible. Like many of us in secular work, we study the manuals of our jobs. Well, this is his job. He's a proclaimer of the word of God. Therefore, he needs to know what the word of God says and spend as much time as possible in learning from it. Preaching is that is ready to, for all occasions, the idea of in season and the, any opportunity that arises. But out of season is the idea that he will seek those opportunities to preach the gospel at such periods as might be inconvenient to himself or when there might be hindrances or embarrassments or when there is no stated appointment for preaching. As he goes along his day, he seeks opportunities to preach the word of God. In 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, he preaches a word, the word of God that reproves. To such, in this idea, he uses arguments that might convince men of the truth of religion and of their need to follow it. You know, I'm reminded of Jesus in John chapter 6, verse 60 through verse 69. Jesus has just gone through and dealt with the Pharisees and he looks around, his disciples that are staying there with him look around and they see their numbers are dwindling. People are just leaving him. They're not wanting to stick around and hear all the things that he's saying. And they look around and they say, what, you know, what's going on here? And Jesus said, do I offend you? Have I offended you? Disciples say, well, you know, this is a hard saying for people to take. That's why we're losing members. We need to go out here. You know, it wasn't the attitude that we see a lot of times in the Lord's church today when we see people beginning to go out the back door. People are running out there trying to figure out, what, what can we change? What can we do to bring you back? What can we do to keep you here? Jesus wasn't of that mindset. He told them the truth. 
And there were those who refused to obey. And so they left. And he asked the question of those disciples that were staying there. He says, does this also offend you? You know, a lot of people in our world today have a mindset of a gospel preacher that he needs to be somebody that's very nice to people. He needs to be loving. He needs to be a big old teddy bear. And he doesn't need to be a person that's going to say anything that's going to cause anybody harm or cause anybody to, to feel bad about themselves. But Jesus didn't have that attitude. And Jesus was the master teacher. He is the one whom we are to emulate, to follow. And we don't go out of our way to offend people. We don't go out of our way to do any of those kind of things. But you know, the truth, spoken in its simplicity, is going to cause problems for those who refuse to give up their sin. It always will. And you know, I've always said that if you've never gone through life hearing gospel preachers and at times in your life you haven't been mad about what he said, that either you're not listening to what he's saying or you're in denial in your sin. Because a true gospel preacher will preach and teach things that's going to cause people to get upset, to be mad, to be angry. You know, we make a joke among preachers who have preached full time, you know, well, you know, I got up there and preached a moving sermon. And we don't mean it was all emotional and, and everybody just was crying and we were passing out the Kleenex. No, we were talking about we preached a sermon that caused us to have to pack our things and move because the congregation wasn't willing to stand for the truth. That's the kind of preachers that we need today. Preaching that convinces or reproves. Bring about arguments that will convince men of the truth of religion and of their need of it. You know, we live in a world today who a lot of people just don't even understand that they're lost. Lost where? No, I know where I'm going. I'm going down here to the corner store. No, I'm going to my job. Or I've got a GPS. How can I be lost? You see, they're talking about lost on one plateau and we're talking about your soul. Where are you going when you die? A lot of people don't think much about anything above today or tomorrow or next week. Where are you going to spend eternity? Well, you know, it's up to the gospel preacher to remind you where you're going to spend eternity if you continue in the actions that you're involved in. And that's his job. That's what God expects of him. He's also one that rebukes, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2. The idea he admonishes or charges sharply. There are times when a preacher might have to raise his voice for the pulpit. He's not doing it just for emphasis. He's doing it because he's telling you something that you need to listen to. The idea of chiding them for sin. Some privately. You know, sometimes just going and visiting someone and talking to them about something, that'll take care of the problem. Others more publicly. I've done this route and it hasn't worked, therefore we've got to deal with this publicly. Maybe the elders come to the preacher and say, you know, we need a sermon on X, Y, or Z. And now it's done publicly. Paul likewise charged Timothy, charged Titus also, that he must be ready to rebuke the brethren. Preaching that exhorts, chapter 4 and verse 2. In other words, we encourage and strengthen by consolation. Number five, teaching that is long-suffering. Patient, forbearance, long-suffering, slowness in avenging wrongs. The idea... You know, some people in calling out wrong will change it immediately. Others, there may be some unwinding that has to happen. I can't just today change this. It's going to take a little time. Or I might have to sit down and talk to them a little bit further. 
Show them more from the scripture. That's what they need to do. But ultimately, we teach with long suffering. And then in chapter 4 and verse 2, it says, and in teaching or doctrine, the idea of the instruction, that which is taught, doctrine, teaching, concerning something, the act of teaching, instruction. And the idea of all this then begins to show us this is what God expects of a gospel preacher. He's to preach God's word and only God's word. But there is preaching also that displeases God. <laughs> preaching unsound doctrine. This is going on all about us and sadly going all about us even in the Lord's church today. Man, they're standing up calling themselves gospel preachers and yet they're not teaching certain things or they're teaching things that are contrary to the will of God. Therefore, they're not fulfilling their obligation as a gospel preacher. A time will come when they not endure sound doctrine, Paul says in chapter 4 and verse 3. The idea of healthy doctrine. Doctrine that contributes to the health of the soul or to salvation. These people come not teaching those things that are helpful for you to go to heaven. They're teaching things that will cause you to go to hell. Times of which Paul also had warned Timothy when people give heed to deceiving spirits. Chapter 4, uh, 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 through 2. When people will be lovers of themselves and pleasure. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 and 2. They want to hear things according to their own desires. Chapter 4 and verse 3 of 2 Timothy. And that justifies their sinful behavior rather than rebukes them for it. It's the idea that if I see a sin issue, I'm obligated to point it out, to deal with it, discuss it. But we see around us today those who call themselves preachers and they're going whole hog into all the sinful activities that people are doing today. The homosexuality is running rampant in our society. Now, many of them are sitting up here in pulpits, preaching and teaching. And yet they, they themselves are in sin. They also preach to entertain. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 3, it talks about people who have itching ears. They love to have their ears scratched and tickled from smooth things. They are pleasing and agreeable to natural men. You know, I, uh, <laughs> I've had people come and worship with us, visited with us, and they've come and they say, well, you know, that, that guy, you know, they sit in the... In the uh, Pew, and afterwards, you hear some of the comments they have. Well, you know, that guy, he quotes a lot of Bible. That's what a gospel preacher is supposed to do. You know, he seems to be so negative. He talks about, well, that's what he's supposed to do. But he also encourages, rebuking and encouraging. But we want to be entertained. Endless curiosity. The desire of variety. They want to get their ears tickled with the language and accent of the person, abandoning the good and faithful preacher for the fine preacher. They love to hear even true preachers if they are eloquent. You know, a lot of people, you know, I, uh, I've said this before. I was there at Freed Hardman around the time that Rubel Shelley was really starting to really turn him, turn. I mean, just full throttle. And they had an open forum there in Memphis that we were able to go to one day to hear him speak. And I'm going to tell you something. He is a very eloquent speaker. In fact, he was a pleasure to listen to. It. If he was going to talk about automobiles or something like that, boy, I could have stayed up there listening to him all day long. He's just that kind of speaker. The problem is he was holding a position that is false doctrine. And he was giving his side of it. Eloquence. Education. We place a lot of emphasis on those kind of things. Now that we have so many things that take away our 
uh, our minds today. You know, we've got all the little gadgets and things that we could spend so much time on. And so if we're going to have to listen to somebody, man, you need to be entertaining. You need to tell us something that's going to make us feel good. Keep our attention. And we see this coming out in a lot of ways because people are now going out the back door in droves because y'all won't change. It needs to be more entertaining. We can't be here. And they go down the street to some place. They'll put on all kind of circus acts and things like that just to get people to come. They heat to themselves teachers, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3. There'll be plenty of teachers willing to accommodate them. A lot of them coming out right out of our Christian colleges and schools of preaching that will accommodate them in anything they want because they don't want to make waves. People will find teachers that will please them. The sad result of such preaching is people will turn their ears away from the truth. The truth of God will not interest them. And what a sad state to be in if the truth of God does not interest you. But we find that more and more today. They have no time to hear that the truth, what the truth has to say. And they'll be turned aside to fables, Paul says. And they'll believe any kind of nonsense. You know, the truthfulness is that people will reject the word of God, but they'll believe in all types of witchcraft, UFOs, channeling, and all manner of things. People reject the gospel of Christ, but they will accept religious traditions of men. Not unlike the time of Jesus. The Pharisees brought charges against his disciples for not washing their hands. You see, you... You're not making them wash their hands. And, and that's a tradition that was passed down to us from our fathers. And Jesus said, but you're, the words you ought to be listening to are what God says, not what your fathers say. You see, they pass those traditions down. People reject sound doctrine, but they accept unhealthy teaching that endangers not only the body, but also the soul. In all of this, we realize people who reject the truth are abandoned by the, bet, the just judgment of God because when they leave the truth, they leave God. And therefore, when we think about a gospel preacher and all that that means, he spends his time in the word of God, memorizing, preparing lessons, preparing studies for classes as well as in the pulpit for personal Bible study and all manner of things that he does. And he does all those things realizing that he can only speak about that which God has revealed. He doesn't get up to entertain us. He doesn't get up to tell a lot of jokes. He doesn't get up to make us feel good. He gets up to teach us what God wants us to know. And sometimes he may repeat it over and over. But the Bible is full of things that are repetition. The problem is the type of preaching people want to listen to. They listen to be entertained, to justify the lust of the flesh. They do not listen to be saved, to learn the way of righteousness. Those who dare to preach today, those who desire to hear, should make sure the preaching is that which pleases God. The preacher, teachers, have a stern warning that comes to us from the scriptures. In James 3 and verse 1, it says, My brethren, be not many masters. You look that word up, he's talking there about teachers, preachers. Knowing that they shall receive the greater condemnation. You go back to the role of what a preacher does. He sets forth the proper example. And he preaches the word of God. And for that, he keeps in mind that there's a greater condemnation if he varies from what God commands to be said. 
Deuteronomy 18 and verse 20, going back to the idea of the prophet. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name. This is God talking about this prophet. Which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. You know, God chose through the foolishness of preaching to save man. Let's turn over to Romans chapter 10 as we began to close out. Romans chapter 10. Begin verse 14, well, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, you've got to keep this in its context. There's a lot of people today who are calling upon the name of the Lord, but they're not doing it the way God commands it to be done. So how do they know how to call upon the name of the Lord? Well, read the next verse. How then shall they call on him of whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The question of this lecture was, is it unacceptable to God? Because that's the final authority. What is pleasing to God? Is it unacceptable to God for a preacher to teach anything but the truth? Paul addressed it, God's addressed it, and God says it is. It's unacceptable. In fact, in the Old Testament, if you taught something that God did not command you to teach, he said, put them to death. Is this serious? Yes. Souls are at stake. But it also comes back to the idea that as a congregation, as members of the Lord's church, we need to make sure that we hire men that want to preach and teach, that will preach only what God commands them to preach. Nothing more, nothing less. Preach the truth and realize that with it comes consequences because they will receive a greater condemnation.